Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Hope you're having a phenomenal day. We're gonna dive in and do a live Q&A here. We're gonna go into a whole bunch of questions and see how I can help. Uh, before we dive in, make sure you go click on thyroidresetsummit.com. Make sure you subscribe to my awesome summit that's happening in early March. I interviewed 30 of the top um, thyroid experts in the world. And you know, I'm, I'm a thyroid clinician as well and have thyroid issues. So we really dive in. We have a good clinical perspective on all the questions and all the interviews. So you're going to get lots of actionable information to help improve your thyroid. So head over to thyroidresetsummit.com and subscribe and look forward to seeing you there later. Awesome. So let's dive in. We got some questions already in the queue. Irma writes in, Dr. J, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks, Irma. I appreciate it. Uh, Didi writes in, my young friend did a Dutch and her hormones were on point. She still had low estrogen symptoms, and once she was put on bioidentical estradiol, she felt a hundred times better. It's weird. Yeah, I mean, I'd want to know what on point meant. Um, are we talking like in the middle of the reference range, top 25%? I'd also want to know where her estrogen progesterone ratio is. And I also want to know how she's doing like with the estrogen metabolites because they break it down E1 or estrone, E2 or estradiol, E3 or estriol. And also it matters if um, she's menopausal or cycling because you know, more estriol when you're menopausal, more estradiol when you're cycling. And then the progesterone to estrogen ratio really matters a lot. So Hope that helps. If you have any numbers you want to shoot over, that'd be helpful too. Jeff writes in, is there a way to chelate what they are spraying over us? I had a lot more headaches and more neuralgic pains when I try to think uh, that my mind is trying to, th uh, when I try to think it hurts. Okay. So in general, I mean, there's some evidence that maybe they're spraying, you know, on the, on the geoengineering side, uh, aluminum and barium salts. I've seen some of that um, come into the public sphere you know, to declassify documentation. I can't say for certain, but we definitely know there's a lot of pesticides. We definitely know there's a lot of glyphosate. We definitely know Roundup and potential heavy metals. So I mean, I think there's a lot of other things to worry about as well. And I would say how we detoxify from those would be similar, right? We're going to drink enough water, right? The solution to pollution is dilution. We're going to get lots of good sulfur amino acids in our body through healthy animal products and, and healthy vegetables. And we're going to make sure our digestion's good. And that's going to be the first um, method right there. And then of course, um, sleeping good, eating good, pooping good, having good nutrition. That's going to be the best way no matter what you're getting exposed to. Uh, Ty writes in, Dr. Jay Zong, colloidal silver are the exceptions to using it, 10 to 23 part per million against mold, bacteria, parasites, viruses for someone who is compromised immune system and weak adrenals and weak thyroid. All right. So yeah. So if you're using uh, colloidal silver, like in my line, we have one called GI Clear 3. That's a nano silver. That works really great. And I use that. It's a good biofilm buster, number one. I could tell you um, personally, my mom's a surgical room nurse, so she works in surgeries and she helps out with all kinds of different surgeries. And one of the things they've started doing in the last five years or so is um, with a lot of the total joints, like in orthopedic surgery, like total hip, knee, um, et cetera, they come in and they wrap the joint with this aluminum, not aluminum, but a silver foil. And it's basically silver. It's like a saran wrap of silver that goes over the joint. And the reason they started doing that is because they found they had less MRSA MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, so resistant bacteria. So it's super helpful. So even conventional surgery is actually starting to use it. You don't hear much about it though. Um, so in general, yeah, I like it. I think it's great. Smaller, I think it's better. Gets into the cell, can have antiviral effects. I like it. Uh, the Corvac writes in, is maca powder good for libido? Yeah, it is. Maca powder is also known as Peruvian ginseng. In my line, we use one called Feminescence. There's a cycling one, a menopausal one. Um, I like that one the best because it's a specific phenotype of maca that works really good depending on what you're, where you're at in your, um, whether you're menopausal or cycling. I like that a lot. Jessica Lynn writes in, hello, my dad just got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Any real good tips uh, while in a flare and how to live after a flare lets up. Also, is aloe okay for ulcerative colitis? So Jessica, I did a video two weeks ago on this exact thing, what to do with an autoimmune flare. Go watch that. But in general, cut the diet. Like, like look at what the cause was. Was he going off his diet? Was he eating a whole bunch of crap or refined sugar or alcohol or grains? Solve that. Fix that. Number two is cook and make your meals more soup-like and easier to process so there's less fiber, there's less undigested particles, and everything is really easy to access from a nutritional perspective. And then number three is we can add in soothing nutrients like L-glutamine, DGL, aloe, slippery elm. We can add in those really good soothing healing nutrients. In my line, we use GI 
restore. And that's super helpful because there's a lot of good nutrients right there. And then of course he can do sip some of the ginger tea, see my ginger tea article. And then also bone broth is super helpful as well. So, but he may need a little bit of prednisone if the flare over the top. So try to see what you can do nutritionally and supplement wise and see if that's enough. Hopefully it is. And again, this, all my advice and feedback is for entertainment purposes only. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, Ty Nguyen writes in, uh, my sister, my sister who's a Cairo doctor says her zinc copper is 86 over 130, but my online research says zinc to copper should be about one to eight or one to 12. Yeah. I don't get too wrapped up in zinc to copper ratio. Cause if you look at the top, like if we're looking at a paleo template, if you go to myfooddata.com and you look at the top zinc and copper foods, they're almost the same. They're very similar, right? It's going to be your meats, your animal products, your pumpkin seeds, uh, mushrooms, and they're pretty equally high. So a lot of the high zinc foods are also very high or have a little bit of, you know, have a good bit of copper in there as well. Maybe the only exception would be like oysters, right? So in general, the only time you're really, I'm really concerned about zinc copper is if you're doing lots of um, just too much zinc supplementation or too much copper supplementation. If you're eating a really good paleo template, you'll find this pretty good parity in those top zinc rich foods to copper. And you can go to myfooddata.com to look at some of those nutrients. Um, Coles of Fire writes in, my TSH is 1.06, my free T4 is 0.86, my free T3 is 1.54. These are my the uh, these are my thyroid levels. Should I be worried? Well, in general, your TSH most of the time. This is a perfect example for everyone. So, if you were to go see an endocrinologist or a conventional medical doctor, they'd probably only run the TSH. They would see your TSH is one point oh six, which is basically textbook perfect. When you look at T four though, you're in the bottom five percent of the reference range of 0.86. That range goes to like 0.7 to 0.8, all the way to 1.8. So you're in the bottom five percent of that range, and then your free T three is abysmal. 1.54, typically anything below 2.2 or 2.1 is out of the reference range. So that means that you're in the lower two and a half percent of the population. And I'll tell you, 1.54, you're in the probably the bottom one percent of the population. So that's super concerning. Now you have to get to the root cause of what the issue is. Most doctors would never put you on thyroid hormone. Um, the signaling from the brain is not enough to tell the thyroid to make more thyroid hormones. We really have to get thyroid nutrients on board and we may need to add a little bit of thyroid hormone, but I wouldn't touch it right yet. I would really get your adrenals worked up and I don't, you know, judging by your name, I can't see a sex there. So uh, there could be an anemia issue too. When I see these kind of patterns, I see a lot of uh, anemia, low iron, especially with cycling females. Um, they could, if they have estrogen dominance and issues with their hormones, they may be losing extra iron through heavy periods. So that could be affecting thyroid hormones as well. Again, if you're a guy, it's a totally different story. I'd be leading on to a lot more gut stuff um, if that's the case. Hope that helps though. But yeah, you should be worried. That's Those are really concerning levels. And if you need to reach into a functional medicine doc, reach out to myself or Evan. We will be happy to help. Uh, Norbean writes in, notice some oil in the bowl with stools. What did you recommend to help digest fats? Great question. So in my line, we use liver supreme that has bile salts in it to help with the breakdown of the fat. It also has some dandelion, some fringe tree, and some artichoke extract, which helps thin out the bile in case it's stagnant or sludgy. Also some beetroot in there as well, or, or beet powder, beet powder. And then also some phosphorylated serine. Um, yes, phosphorylated serine to help thin out the bile as well. Now that's going to be palliative, may not fix the root issue. So we may have to look deeper in the guts. There could be food allergens. There could be um, infections. There could be low stomach acid as well. So you got to look at the whole complete picture, right? The nice thing about functional medicine is we can come in and we can do some palliative things that are actually going to help you and they're not going to have a whole bunch of side effects unlike a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs. So it's nice, but we have to just kind of, I always draw a line. Okay. What's palliative? What's root cause? We always want to know which is the difference. That way we're always focused on the root cause, but there's no reason why we have to suffer. We should be able to get you feeling better. And also if you're digesting your fats better, Noreen, you're going to have much better energy because you're going to be able to absorb those fat soluble nutrients better versus having them go out in your uh, stool. Uh, K Gupta writes in any supplements for constipation from dairy. I eat high quality goat cheese and I still get constipated. I probably wouldn't be consuming that if your body is responding that way, there's probably some kind of inflammation that's disrupting your migrating motor complex. So I would not, uh, consume that. But if you still want to have a, a nice laxative effect there, I would do like a higher dose magnesium oxide or citrate to bowel tolerance to move that along. 
Uh, Moon Goddess writes in, uh, today I found out I have a microadenoma and swelling in my pituitary gland. Yet my doctor wants to put wants me to stay on methimazole. So pituitary adenoma is a very slow growing tumor. It's typically benign. So I imagine maybe you've heard that so far. And then methimazole is going to decrease um, thyroid hormone production. So it's in a block. It's an inhibit iodine absorption and, and affect your thyroid's ability to make T4. So if your TSH is already suppressed at 0.07 and your T4 and T3 are perfect, yeah, this gets tough. So I would, number one, I would definitely get a second opinion because you don't have a lot of simulation from your TF, from your pituitary to make thyroid hormone. And in my, my personal opinion, but you make sure you go with your medical doctor because they're managing a, a tumor, maybe get a second opinion. My opinion is as long as you are monitoring your T4 and your T3 levels and you're not going outside of the reference range, I think you're perfectly fine. I think the reason why your doctor may be re making this recommendation is because they don't want to monitor it. They just kind of want to fail safe. The problem is you're going to be the victim of that. I think as long as you're monitoring your hormones, the signal from your brain to your thyroid is already suppressed. Maybe they're concerned of the signal going higher at some point. That's my concern. So I'd have them walk them. I'd have I'd have them walk you through their thinking on like, hey, this is why. This is how it could go the wrong way. Because right now it's very counterintuitive. I'm gonna guess they're either lazy or they think maybe the pituitary could over signal. But I would just talk to them and just see if you can test it every couple of weeks or even a month to be on the right side of that. Irma writes in, but tread lightly on that. I, anytime I see tumors, I want to be really careful. Irma writes in, in, in your opinion, is a low sulfur diet an effective way to treat hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide SIBO? Well, I mean, here's the deal, Irma. Um, Sulfur-rich foods are really good. They're really nutrient-dense, right? A lot of broccoli and, and cruciferous veggies are great. Um, I would say right now, if um, – you don't have any other type of overgrowth. Like it's not a hydrogen overgrowth. Uh, it's not a, a methane overgrowth. It's just hydrogen sulfide. I would say if you really feel better cutting those foods out and you're less bloaty and less gassy, I think in the meantime, it's a short-term strategy to starve them out while we come in and kill them later and work on the digestion and then reintroduce those foods later. So as long as it's a short-term thing, I think it's okay. Um, but I'd really wanna make sure that you actually feel better keeping those foods out. If you don't notice much of a difference, then I would just keep it to a typical lower FODMAP template. But that's a really good point, though. Okay, here, let me keep on rolling for y'all. Would gallstones cause me to get bloated and um, something full even after a small meal? Uh, yeah, it's possible, but it could just be low stomach acid or enzymes, too. I'd want to know that you have fat in your stool and your stools are floating. That's the, the deal breaker there. Chronic conditions, right? How... Um, you got to help me out with the English guys. <laughs> I got to translate here live. How do you think dairy? Okay, how do you think dairy creates mucus? As I've seen some sites debunking this, I personally get a very stuffy nose. Okay, so um, number one, it's it's a very mucus forming food. Um, now, what does that mean? I'm not sure if meaning the food has mucus in it. I think it's mucus stimulating. And I think the reason why it's mucus stimulating is because the casein tends to be very hyperallergenic. And part of the allergenic response is more mucus. So I think it's stimulating your body to make more mucus in response to the casein protein, which is more allergenic. And then also dairy has the lactose in there, which is um, hard to digest. That's the sugar component. But if it's raw, you're going to have better uh, ability to break down that because there's more enzymes, the lactase enzymes in the dairy. But in general, it's probably just the casein. Um, Jessica Lynn writes in, I have a, a travel infrared sauna that goes to 140 degrees. What's the ideal usage per week and how long per each session? Great question. Um, I'm actually getting my sauna installed right now. I got a sunlight and sauna. So from what I understand, it's about 20 to 30 minutes a day. And then anywhere between you know three to five days a week, I think is great. You could potentially go every day. The mistakes you have to be aware of is make sure you're drinking really a good electrolyte enhanced water either during and after the treatment to, to get the extra electrolytes back in your body that you're sweating out. And number two, have a good like, you know, soap down and shower after you get out because there's gonna be toxins on, on your skin. And if you just like go hang out and whatever, and then that dries, you're going to reabsorb what came out of your skin. So you have to make sure you shower to get that off to make sure you flush it down the drain, right? If not, you'll reabsorb it. 
Same thing, well, similar with vitamin D, right? If you're lying out in the sun for like a half hour, getting a nice tan and getting a little vitamin D, and then you jump in the pool, guess what happens? You lose a lot of that vitamin D into the water. Keep that in mind with vitamin D. Same thing with vitamin D. Elizabeth writes in, can you take liver supreme with your digestive enzymes or do you usually recommend one or the other? Nope, you totally can, Elizabeth. So, you know, if we are like separating out the HCL enzymes and the bile salts, then you can totally combine them together. Great question. Hope you're doing good too. Coals of fire. Thank you for the info on my thyroid. I've got H. pylori. I'm a male, 37. If I cure it, can I bring my levels back up? Yes. I mean, I would say coals of fire. There's probably a lot of malabsorption and gut inflammation for your thyroid to be where it's at. It's very concerning. The levels are very low. All right. So make sure you double check with your with your doctor on that too. And if you want to dive in deeper too, um, reach out to me because that's concerning. You need to make sure you're working with a good functional medicine doc that's addressing the root issue of that. Okay. Um, Paul O'Hearn, are systemic enzymes useful for Crohn's flare up? Yes. I mean, it depends, right? Because some of them are like have papaya in there or things like that. So as long as you're not sensitive to those, I think it could be okay. Absolutely. But get stable and then add those in. Like get stable first, like cut the foods and stuff out, like do the foundational stuff and then bring that in a couple days later. Um, what are your go-to herbs for overall health? Gut, adrenal, liver cleansing? Great question. For for adrenals, it depends, right? If you're, you know, you're a female. So if you have cycling hormone issues, I may go to a maca or an herb that's going to be more hormonal balancing on the female side. If it's more adrenal or cortisol based, we may look at ashwagandha, rhodiola, ginseng, eleuthero, holy basil, depending on cortisol being high or low. There's different scenarios, right? And then on the liver side, milk thistle is always great. For the liver, it's great at tonifying the liver and helping to recycle glutathione. You have dandelion and artichoke and fringe tree root extract, which are great for the gallbladder, which helps with fat digestion. And then just for the gut in general, I mean, you have slippery elm, you have aloe, you have deglycerized licorice, which are all very healing and soothing for the gut lining and too. Hope that helps. Thanks, Dr. J. I really hate the meds. Yeah, I totally get that. Totally get it. The methimazole, totally. Yeah, make sure you're on top of that. Uh, Adrian writes in, I get an endoscopy and they found mild gastritis, but I have acid reflux, belching, chest pain, stomach pain, and burning pain. And they said they couldn't find any bacteria. Yeah. I mean, endoscopies are tough. It's not the best way to really find things. They'll be able to find a lot of damaged tissue if it's there. I mean, um, you have the acid reflux. I imagine they've they found the inflammation if it's mild gastritis. So they did find some inflammation, but you need a high quality stool test. We may even need a breath test as well. But yeah, you need to work with a good functional medicine doc to dig in deeper. Doing an endoscopy is like taking a bucket. A lot of times, if you're trying to find an infection, it's like taking a bucket, putting the bucket in the water, pulling it out and being like, oh, no fish. There's no fish in this lake. That's kind of how I look at that, right? I know it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you want to do a chronic, uh, you want to do a more functional based stool test that can look at things more specifically. All right. Um, Christian writes in, I got a 42 on an arabinitol O test. That's very high. So that's significant yeast overgrowth. My worst symptom is brain fog, fatigue, migraines. What good supplements to get rid of the acid aldehyde? Um, you have to work on addressing the yeast issue, but you have to make sure the diet's in check, the hormones are in check, and you go through my six R's. So make sure you're working with a good functional medicine doc to work you through the six R's supporting digestion, cutting out the bad foods, supporting the hormones and the gut lining, killing the yeast. And you got to be careful because if all you did was an oat test through maybe another infection along with it, you know, we see what a lot of times the three amigos will see H. pylori, blasto and a yeast overgrowth together. You know, we'll see a lot of times multiple infections layered up. So you want to make sure it's not just yeast and there's not other things along with it. How effective is collagen supplementation for bones and joints? I have, um, and if effective, how long does it take to take effect? Um, I mean, I think it's very effective. Your, your bones are half protein. The other half are about 12 to 13 minerals. Calcium is the predominant one, but there's other minerals in there too. So I think collagen is really important. You need at least half your body weight, half your body weight in um, grams of protein. So you weigh 200 pounds, right? I'm 210, 215, right? So I need at least, you know, do the math. Um, 107, 107 grams of protein. I probably get 150 to 180 though, especially if I'm doing more resistance training. So yeah, and I mean, I would, you know, just follow up with the DEXA scan every year to see how you're doing. I've seen patients stop the loss and improve their bone density. I've seen that time and time again. Also have to make sure your digestion's good. 
Uh, Elizabeth writes in, which probiotic do you recommend for men? Well, in my line, the probioflora is pretty darn good. It's like 12 strains. It's like all your, you know, most of your bifido and lactobacillus strains. It even has the infantis strain, which is, makes it pretty good for kids too, which is more in, more in kids' guts, but they're also in adults' guts too. But that's a pretty good way to do it. Um, the only time I'll, I'll go with more male or female specific probiotics is if I'm treating a woman with a specific UTI or vaginal issue, and then we'll use more strains that are going to be beneficial to the vaginal tract. That's the only time I really get specific outside of I'm using spore biotics. That's the only other thing, but that's not really sex specific though. Great question though. Dr. J, H. pylori um, and, uh, antibodies, IgG in range 5.13, less than 16, but H. pylori antibody IgM is positive. Why is one in range and the other one is positive? Great question. Well, IgM is an acute antibody response. Uh, IgG is a delayed longer term antibody response. All I can think of is that you have an acute infection and your IgG needs a couple more months to rev up um, or it's a false negative. It's, I'm sorry, a false positive, if you will. But if you have symptoms and you see the IgG positive, I'm sorry, if you have symptoms and you see the IgM positive, I would definitely be treating for H. pylori for sure. All right, I'm gonna give a little love to my Facebook peeps over here. Hold on, guys. Lee writes in, um, what would you ask an immunologist on a first appointment if you have past positive Lyme, Gardasil shots, hypothyroid, three nodules, lesion on your shoulder, an ankles, scoliosis, underweight, ED? Oh, man. Honestly, um, your immunologist is probably going to look at you and just like, just be like, what are you talking about? You know, because a lot of times they don't give much credence to Lyme. They're not going to give much credence to any vaccine injuries, even though there's hundreds in the VAERS database. Um, they're not going to be too skilled about a hypothyroid. So they would just rule, they would just refer you out to an endocrinologist and they may still not get to the root cause, which is Hashimoto's most of the time. And then if you're underweight and you have scoliosis and ED, there's probably a lot of gut and malabsorption issues going on too. So you're probably going to be shit out of luck. I'm part of my French. Um, but I think go get like all the pathological things ruled out. And then once you've ruled out all the conventional things, then go reach out to a good functional medicine doc. But it's good to at least get the big conventional things ruled out. I'd rather have someone say, hey, my MD said it's in my head or they can't do much or, hey, here's this drug with a lot of side effects. Because then you at least ruled out and you've done your job on the pathology side and then you can get to the root cause. Riley writes in, what do you think of, of, of allergy docs, the prick test on your arm? I mean, that's going to look more at IgE reactions. So, I mean, if let's say it says, okay, you have this dander issue, you have this mole issue, now what? right? And they're just primarily looking at IgE. So, you know, that's only one response that they're not looking at, you know, delayed IgG or IgA or other immune issues. But I mean, if you have an issue, it's good to know. Now, what are you going to do about it? Maybe you get some air filters, maybe you, you do a little bit more detoxification or support detoxification pathways. Um, is there any connection between, Rakesh writes in, is there any question, is there any connection between cold weather, H. pylori and candida? It's a great question. I'm not sure about that. I'm going to have to to punt that one. Uh, SEI writes in Dr. J, what would you suggest for depression while my thyroid is being compromised by H. pylori? Whew. Well, number one, I would always make sure your diet's 100% dialed in. Fish oil is going to help as well. And just taking extra amino acids, whether it's free form across the spectrum and or additional tyrosine and 5-HCP is always a great way to go. And again, there's a lot of order that needs to be done in which things have to be prioritized. So I kind of say this from a blanket perspective, but work with a good functional medicine doc to kind of work things through the, the algorithm, the hierarchy of the way they should be addressed. But diet, fish oil, and then amino acids, and then specific amino acids last. Hope that helps, guys. And Lee writes in, uh, dang it, it's my last effort. I have two good alternative docs, and I follow you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, just keep doing all those things. Get it ruled out. Just... I want to manage your expectations. I've been there hundreds of times with patients. Uh, manage them. That way you're not going all in in your head. And then just go find a good functional medicine doc that you believe in that um, you know you have a good rapport with. And that's your next step. Okay. Um, C. Kimmy writes in, any natural cures to a UTI? I have one for 11 days, been doing ACV and D. Manos. That's good. That's really good. I would add in maybe one to two tablespoons of silver twice a day, and I would throw in a, a femdophilus probiotic intravaginally at night. Paula Hearn writes in, after only 30 days on your GI clear two, my symptoms are much better for the H. pylori. Great. Should I continue to take for 60 days? Yes, do 60 days on that. 
total. And if you're doing good, great. If you need to add in like a GI clear one, which is my broader spectrum bacteria, you can do that too. And definitely um, be on probiotics after. Make sure you don't ignore the probiotic phase after the fact. Uh, Janine writes in, what do you think about celery juice for helping digestive issues and inflammation? I think someone's watching Anthony Williams, the medical medium. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I know Anthony talks about that a lot. So, you know, when you deal with lots of patients like I do, you get, you know, you get questions from everywhere. All right, cool. Mama Fi writes in, I'm 43, early menopause. At 43, that's too early. Uh, 145 80, uh, over 87, blood pressure, way too high. I work out six days a week and, and on keto, my weight's 130. Okay, so we got some concerns there. Um, 43 and early menopause, you need to go see a functional medicine doc. That's way too soon. I'm concerned about over-exercise. Your, your weight seems good. I don't know your height though. Uh, I'm very concerned about your blood pressure being high. That makes me think your adrenals are being overtaxed big time. Um, so you need to get your adrenals looked at and you need to get your hormones looked at big time. And I would potentially look at adjusting your exercise. I don't know enough to say specifically, but I'm going to think that maybe there's a little bit over sympathetic, uh, overly kind of dominant sympathetic nervous system based on working out too much too. Do you ever worry about a patient consuming too much protein and fat and the implications of that on liver health? How much is too much? I'm not worried about that on liver health at all. I had a patient come back today that actually cut their fat and protein, got a CAT scan, was eating more carbs, and they had a fatty liver where a year before me, before they dropped off the wagon, they were fine. So I'm confident that the literature shows that fatty liver is going to be caused by excess carbohydrate and fructose. That's the main driver of non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis. Um, the only thing with protein and fat is if you do too much, it may, you know, your, your digestive system is already compromised, then you may have a hard time breaking those things down. So I am concerned about that. So make sure you're doing HCL and enzymes. And most people, if they do too much protein and fat, they're going to get weighed down. They're going to feel too tired. And you always have that gauge of, you know, half a gram to one gram per pound of protein. I'm sorry, half a gram to one gram per pound of, uh, you know, your, your body weight. So Elizabeth, I think you're like 130, 120 pounds, right? So you're, that's like a 60 to 80 gram kind of protein thing. So you're looking at maybe three to four ounces of protein per meal, but let your appetite gauge you if you're doing more workout or you're not absorbing well, you may need a little bit more. And then also just adjust the HCL and enzymes and make sure your stools are looking good. If your stools are good, they're not floating, there's not a lot of particles in there, then you're on the right track. Um, are citrus fruits bad? Oh, also one last thing, people that do higher fat, higher protein diets, they actually tend to under eat just a little bit. And part of it is because those foods send a very good satiating signal to the apostat in the hypothalamus, which tells your body that, you know, Hey, I'm satiated. I'm full. So you, you don't quite get that with the carbs. So it's, it's harder to eat too much on that side of the fence. Are citrus fruits bad to consume if you have acid reflux and are taking your digestive enzymes? Maybe. I mean, they're higher in histamine. So yeah, potentially. I always say if that's happening, cut it out, see how you do. Same with coffee. Um, very informative. Thanks, Doc. What would you suggest for mild depression since my thyroid is compromised at the, at the moment? Well, I would say first thing is amino acids and fish oil. That's your best thing. And I have a whole podcast on that specifically. Okay. And then... T-Bone writes in, when I cook bones for bone broth, perfect name, T-Bone talking about bones, excellent. Um, the bones become so soft, I could eat the entire bone. Is it too much calcium or is it okay to eat the entire bone? That's a great question. I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I do know that if I put my, you know, the chicken bones down, my dog will, will just eat the whole thing in like two bites. Um, so um, as long as you're, you're grinding it up pretty good and you're making it like a bone meal where you're not having any shards of things that you're swallowing, then you're probably okay if it's more like a bone meal. Um, Amelia writes in any hopes for a 34 year old female that hasn't had a period since age 18 and they get her cycle back. Any hopes for balancing hormones again? I had, I had a baby at age 29 with IVF. Okay, good. Disease, um, hypothyroid with Hashi's now gaining weight. Did they diagnose you with premature ovarian, ovarian failure? I'm just curious. But um, yeah, it is. Um, I had a patient just uh, last week, two years, no period. It's back, which is great. Now, yours is a lot longer. But I mean, I don't know your health history yet. But I'll just tell you, uh, having seen dozens of patients just like you, almost always there's an eating disorder involved. Um, 
either eating disorder like bulimia or anorexia or just like a lot of crash diets, a lot of low calorie dieting. And you can give me a thumbs up if that's right or not. Um, but I see that to be a common thread. And then of course, like you already mentioned, there's some kind of autoimmune implication as well. And then of course, the crash dieting, the, um, the low calorie stuff also creates low nutrition. And then your body's essentially starving. So your body's saying, okay, fertility is kind of expensive on the metabolic side. So it turns that off. It cuts that bill off the, uh, the priority list. It's like, hey, you know, I got heat, water, electricity. I got my cell phone and I got like Netflix, right? What comes off the top? My cell phone and Netflix are gone. That's kind of what your body looks at when it allocates and prioritizes resources. Fertility, gone. Forget that, right? You can't, you can barely manage yourself. So that's kind of what I look at, but you definitely want to work with a good functional medicine doc to dial this in. It's a little tricky, but great question. Uh, Christian writes in, thank you. How do you recommend getting the adequate fat intake in your diet with gastroparesis? You got to fix the gastroparesis, uh, HCL enzymes. Um, you got to be careful with HCL with gastroparesis. So you may need some natural prokinetics to support that. I did a um, video on gastroparesis just two weeks ago. So go look back at that. You're welcome, T-Bones. Uh, and then Dee writes in, celery juice, feel nothing when I take it. Yeah. I think it's good that you try it if you don't have an issue or if you don't notice anything, you know, you just pass on it. Um, Jeff writes in, my grandma has been eating wheat bread and has stomach pain for like four days straight. She's afraid. Now she's become gluten intolerant for a 76-year-old woman. Help, please, for weight gain. Well, I mean, I think most people are gluten sensitive for sure, and they do better. I mean, I imagine she's probably aware of it more because maybe you're bringing it to her attention, Jeff. I know I've been educating you for a while. You're probably maybe bringing that up. You're maybe having conversations about it, and now she's more aware. But hopefully you can get her off it for like a month and see how well she does. She may do great. All right, Kay Gupta writes in, how do you know if the stool test, how do you know if the stool test my naturopath is ordering is high quality? Well, I'll just tell you, my favorites are the GI map by DSL. I also like the BioHealth 401H is a good one. And then there's a, um, a three-day one by um, Doctors Data. It's a three-day one, and there's also a DRG one as well. Those are my top five. There's probably some others that are pretty good too, um, but those are my fave. T-Bone writes in, is it okay to eat things you are allergic to with the, aller the allergic reaction is only mild, or is it causing more harm than good? That's a great question. Every now and then, I'll get a tiny bit of runny nose when I have my butter coffee. It doesn't happen that often, so I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. So I think if it's mild and it's not causing any cognitive issues or mood issues, I don't think it's a big deal. Just keep an eye on it. Let's see here. Steve writes in, quinoa okay on gluten-free. Read two different things. Hey, Steve, hope you're doing good. Uh, quinoa has a similar amino acid sequence to gluten. So I think as long as you're not super gluten sensitive, I think, you know, 80-20 rule, 20% of the time, it's probably okay as long as you're not having any reactions on there. All right, good. Excellent. Uh, Amelia writes in, could my hormone balance... Could my hormone imbalances have anything to do with my gut question above? HCL, enzymes, still undigested food and stools, bowel movement loose four times in the morning. Wow. And lots of food sensitivities. Heck yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just a lot of stuff going on there, Amelia. Totally. Make sure you get with someone to get these things prioritized. A lot of issues. Just want to make sure like, you know, I'm all about giving lots of quick free tips here. But when things are deep, I'm going to like be a broken record on like, make sure you have a good functional medicine doc. I want to make sure... People don't get lost in this. There's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts, and it's easy to get overwhelmed. Uh, reader writes in, what are the best foods to help with candida? How to eliminate sugar cravings? Well, first, shift your metabolism to being a fat burner versus a sugar burner. How do you do that? High quality proteins at every meal, lots of good healthy fats as well, and lean more on non-starchy vegetables over fruit and starch You know, for your carbohydrate sources. That's the first step. There's some killing steps as well, but that's the first one. Uh, why is the probiotic phase so important after H. pylori killing? Well, if you don't do a probiotic phase, your body tends to, it, it's like this, right? If you go weed the garden out, right, and you don't do anything else besides weeding, what are the chances that healthy seeds grow back? No, what's going to happen is weeds will start growing back in a few months. It's that same thing with our gut. We have what's called a rebound fungal overgrowth. A lot of medical doctors are even treating people with antibiotics and they're recommending like diflucan or a um, antifungal right afterwards. 
And I'm like, come on, let's give the good probiotics right afterwards to help repopulate. So we throw the seeds down to fill up the, the space, right? Nature abhors a vacuum. So where there's empty space, the weeds will come back. So we want to fill that space up. It's kind of like with your in your brain. If you're not thinking good positive thoughts, you're probably thinking negative thoughts. So you put the good positive thoughts in to take the place of the bad. Same thing with your gut bacteria. Lots of good beneficial bacteria to help repopulate where the bad would be. Uh, Bridget writes in, while taking beef thyroid uh, work for hypothyroid treatment instead of a pharmacy compounded or, or NDT, it definitely can. You have to make sure that it's being monitored. Um, you know, TSH, T4, T3 antibodies, and then you have to make sure that other things are being addressed. If there's gut issues or if there's nutrient issues or there's adrenal issues, make sure the full picture, but yeah, it definitely could just make sure you're testing though. We don't want to be guessing. We want to be assessing, uh, what's your best gut flora test you recommend? Um, in my line, I like the gut, the GI map by DSL. I like that one. It's good. Uh, what's the best way to balance your nervous system? Is it the optogenic herbs or is there anything else you can do? Well, Honestly, sleep, good sleep, good anti-inflammatory nutrient-dense diet. Make sure you eat in peace so you have good relaxation, breathing through your nose, and then drinking good, clean, filtered water with extra minerals. That's a good first step. Notice I barely didn't even say any supplements there, right? Foundation is diet and lifestyle. Remember that. Paul writes in, H. pylori concerns if I date and kiss many girls. Well, yeah, I'd be concerned, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, you know, I'm a married man, but if I was in the field, I'd be taking more H. pylori herbs because there's a lot of people that have that infection. So make sure H. pylori clearing herbs, GI clear two, and or um, healthy, good probiotics as well. Be careful with that. T-Bone, you're the smartest person I know. Well, thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere with me, but uh, I'm, I'm too humbled to know there's too many other teachers that I've learned from, but I appreciate that. Is there anything natural? Oh, I lost you. Where did you go? Is there anything natural that can be taken to get rid of varicose veins? Yeah, there's um, some bioflavonoids that can be used to help with the vein strength. Horse chestnuts are a great one. There's like uh, venopectin. There's another, I want to say it's dicosinin. Dicosinin, there's a couple of creams on the market with that compound in it. You can rub it. You can take the horse chestnut internally and also collagen um, because a lot of the veins, you know, the veins, the structure of the veins made through collagen. So make sure you're getting good collagen in there too. That should help. Uh, will garlic, um, will garlic sure SIBO being antibacterial or will it worsen SIBO being a FODMAP? Um, well, if you're doing garlic to kill SIBO, you're going to be using allicillin. You're not going to be doing garlic by itself. So you'll be using a specific extract of the garlic that's more potent and that should be helpful. Can eating too much dairy lead to kidney stones? Well, Calcium oxalates are the big ones. Then you have uric acid, kidney stones. Um, I would say probably not. I mean, you're going to get more of the, the oxalate. The high oxalate foods will be the driving factors of that. And then just inflammation, grains, and things like that. Glad you like the answer, Steve. Excellent. What are natural treatments to balance adrenal fatigue and hypothyroid? A little too broad, Bridget. Go to justinhealth.com. I've done hour-long podcast on that. That way you'll get more intel. Okay. Is there a cure for vitamin B12 injection induced excitotoxicity? Oh, I didn't even know about that. Tell me about that. Uh, let me know below. But in general, um, you know, I'll only do injections of B12 that have severe, you know, malabsorption gut issues. If not, typically sublingual is good enough. Ty writes in controversy on whether to take whole food based calcium or not calcified arteries and joints possibility. I mean, in my supplement, we do like a couple hundred milligrams of calcium dimalate. So we're using a malic acid calcium. Um, but just make sure your, your supplements are good regarding I just don't take too much either. You know, I wouldn't go over the top unless you're trying to support bone health and you have some data to support it. Hope that helps. Jeff writes in, thank you. My GI map is in testing. So we can hopefully find something helpful and touch bases. Actually, well, great. Very good. We can totally touch base, Jeff, and, and God bless your family as well. Thank you. CW, nice to meet you. T-Bones, what's the best way to gain weight with Crohn's and sensitive stomach, i.e., what are high-calorie digestible foods? Well, I mean, you have your proteins, your fats, and then your carbs. So we have to choose ones that work, right? So maybe healthy beef or chicken. Um, maybe healthy carrots, squash, right? And then we'll throw them in like an Instapot or a soup. And you're probably going to need an elemental diet on top of that. 
an elemental diet, which are amino acids and healthy carbs already in there, but broken down already to make it really easy on your gut so you can absorb these nutrients very simply. So that's going to be, you know, the best step on top of a good diet, you know, whether you're doing like an SCD phase one or intro plus a little bit of elemental formula on top of it. Uh, Karen writes in, if taking EDTA for high lead level on a urine challenge test, do I need to take binders as well? Best one if needed. Well, um, it just depends. If you're having a lot of die-off issues, yeah, we could throw in a bentonite clay or an activated charcoal or a modified citrus pectin. I'd probably go with the citrus pectin just because it's a little bit more of a systemic binder. That'd be helpful. But if you're doing good and you're going low dose and you're working on the gut, I'm okay with that. Uh, Steve writes in again, some digestive products contain L-cysteine like the Infanzyme and obviously NAC. Can this raise added homocysteine levels? Uh, again, I read two different things. Well, typically if you look at homocysteine, the metabolism goes from like a, like methionine to acidental methionine to, to homocysteine to cysteine. So there's these intermediary steps. So cysteine comes after. So typically cysteine should be going to glutathione. So my opinion, I would think it would not increase homocysteine because it's coming one step down, homocysteine's one step above cysteine. That's what I've seen though. Let me know if you see something different. Akimo, AKA Akbar, writes in, I'm on the third month of GI Clear 1, 4, and 5 with Para 1 and Silver. Need to be taken for a month after that. Uh, I don't have your protocol in front of me, Akbar, so you'll have to put more information on that. But you should be done your clearing herbs, man. You've been taking them way too long. We need to have a follow-up consult so we can review kind of where you're at. But I think you need to be done those herbs very, very soon, okay? Noreen write, wrote in, I moved recently. How do I find a functional medicine doc? Is there a website with a list? I mean, you'd have to Google, but I mean, I'm available virtually. So my little plug for myself, wherever you are in the U.S. or the world, I could be your functional medicine doc if you like justinhealth.com and you can schedule. Outside of that, I would just search um, for people in your area like you found me here tonight. That's how what I would do. I wish you the best of luck, okay? And if you want an intro consult with uh, my staff, you can schedule that justinhealth.com slash free hyphen consult. I'm a 34-year-old male with many of the same health challenges you speak of. I'm curious of a general dollar amount that someone who need to have to work with you over a six month period or so. So it depends. Like my costs are really simple. I mean, you have labs. You may do start between one to four labs. That may range between one hundred to four hundred dollars a lab. It just depends what's going on. And then supplements may range between one hundred dollars to to four hundred dollars a month. It depends what area is being addressed at each time. But I'd say you know anywhere between. You know, I would say on the intro side, 2000 to the upper side, 5000 ish, you know, over a six month period. And again, for me, you know, we're targeting things and it depends. We can always adjust the amount of labs, adjust the amount of supplements and adjust goals and timelines. So there's a lot of custom customization that goes involved in that, but that's a pretty good estimate. Amelia writes in, do you have a preferred brand of water filter or purification system for your home? Yes, I do. Um, I have, you go to justinhealth.com slash water filter. You'll see it. If you go to my site, go to justinhealth.com and click on the healthy living store or justinhealth.com slash shop. Click on recommended products and you'll see the exact ones that I have in my home. I only make recommendations of things that I purchased and that I use in my family and that I'm happy with. That's it. That's how I roll. Um, Dr. J, thanks for the cast. I've been keto adapted for two plus years, never got hypoglycemic, great, or had any issues, now half a year or so, um, into intermittent fasting. I got sharp kidney pain a few times in hour 16. Interesting. I keep an eye on that. You may want to look at oxalates, may want to look at adding extra potassium and magnesium. Sometimes those can get missed in a ketogenic diet. What minerals would you recommend post-coffee enema? Great question. Um, I would probably be just doing a high, you know, just a really good enriched uh, mineral water. But if we need it, I would do like something like an Endure by Trace Mineral Research, where it has extra potassium, magnesium, sodium, chloride, and sulfate. But, you know, good Pellegrino with some extra Redmond's Real Salts, great, good too. All right, guys, I got to jump off here. I, my wife's got dinner all made for me, and I got a nice ginger kombucha. And then dessert tonight is going to be some organic blueberries and some unsweetened coconut yogurt. So... And I may have a 90% dark chocolate. We'll see. It's a long night. So 
All right, guys, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm trying to be reaching out all the time, connecting. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a share. I appreciate it all. Share with a family or friend that could benefit, that wants to chime in and gets a little bit of support here. So I appreciate everything. You guys have a phenomenal night. Take care. Bye.